Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome on behalf of Amsterdam Neuroscience to the annual meeting 2020, a very different one this time. Uh, but a warm welcome to all of you. I think that there are many people uh, joining us from everywhere, from the office, from the lab, the hospital, maybe the bathtub, the garden, in a train somewhere. And we are very happy that you found us this way. Uh, this is a special meeting, this one. Uh, I, I'm hosting today, and that means that I will be master of ceremonies, but uh, fortunately, I'm joined by real experts on the theme, and that's very important. So uh, I would like uh, to introduce you to the director of Amsterdam Neuroscience, scientific director, Arjen Brussart. Uh, I heard that he is um, kind of the godfather of the crew and of, of, of the whole department of the, the Amsterdam Neuroscience, because he connects everyone and he facilitates and he makes sure that all the stakeholders find each other and he develops talent and he's very proud of all of his children. Is that a correct description, that's, Arjen? That's sort of my game, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and, but, but I heard that you too, because on my other side is the co-director, uh, Diederik, um, Diederik van der Beek, um, you were described as pragmatic and down to earth. Is it true? Do you, do you balance each other out? Yeah, I think so. I think we are a great match for the, for the institute. And uh, of the last, well, we, we've been doing this for five years or so now. Yeah, someone and, uh, figured this out in 2015, yeah. and so we, we worked together in 2015 and then launched the institute in this current setting in 2016. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, and, and do you have to slow him down sometimes? Well, sometimes, but uh, he also learned, right, over the last five years. So, I did? Uh, yeah, I oh, think wow. so. <laughs> <laughs> good, revelations already, that's a good thing. Um, so now we have a very different annual meeting Absolutely. this year. Um, what do you think of being in a studio like this, Diederik? I well, can... it feels uh, comfortable. It does? Yeah, I, I, yeah. So uh, normally we do it in the uh, Amsterdam ar arena, right? Yeah. With 600 people or, or maybe more. And then I'm more stressed than today, I oh, think. Oh, really? Yeah. So this is a relaxing situation well, for you. Well, you belong perhaps, in, a, yeah. in a TV studio. Well, <laughs> I don't know whether I belong in a TV studio, but... Uh, if you feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. You can get used to it. <laughs> yeah, you can get used to it, yeah. yes. And how's that for you, being online today completely? Yeah, I think this is a game changer mm. for us. I think uh, this is actually uh, s some sort of, this is my 12th meeting with the institutes because we were already existing before 2016. I think it was a lot of work for the back office, you know, the event organizers and the communication officers. And, sure. um, and, but, you know, I think this is, I think this is going to stay. Yeah. I think we're going to go, you know, at most we're going to go to hybrid meetings now with maybe, you know, maybe 100 people in the, in the studio. Really? You think that, that, that I think 500 people is, is over? It's I don't see it again? happen in 2021. No. And we'll, we'll see. Maybe later? There's something special there as well, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. I guess. We will try and uh, make sure that we make a connection to you at home or in the lab or wherever you are um, uh, to, uh, to talk to us and to respond and to ask questions. That's very important. We will do that all day long through an app and it's called Slido, but you don't need to know that name because in your screen you will see a, a little cloud on the side of your screen and when you click that you will enter Slido. But also uh, lovely is that you can also uh, find it on your phone, so you can take a break, walk around and still discuss with us everything that's been discussed here today. So then you go to the site, and the site's called Slido, S-L-I-D-O, dot com, and then we have an event code that you have to enter, which is very easy because it's hashtag AM2020. Well, th that's easy. And when you go there, um, you will have the ability to vote for polls and questions we want to ask you. But most important feature, throughout the day, you will be able to ask us questions. Well, not us only, all the very interesting scientists that will appear today. About that program, we will uh, talk to these gentlemen a little more after we ask you a few questions. After that, we will have four researchers that have very interesting developments to talk to us about. Um, we will have the Swammerdam lecture, which is an important part of the meeting, always. And we will have a Pecha Kucha segment later on the day, and you will vote which one is best there. Well, many things to discuss, but let's start with a Slido poll. 
Um, we want to ask you first, because we are curious who's here, and we will see that uh, showing up uh, later. We want to ask you what you are. Well, we mean what your profession is or your function title. And the first one is, um, I am a... And could you please fill in if you are a principal investigator, if you are a faculty member or resident, if you are a postdoc or a research associate, if you are a PhD student or a master student, or something else, category other. What do you think could be in the other category, Diederik? Well, research technicians. Technicians, yeah, good one. Working yes. in the lab. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think? I think yeah, nurse, nurse researchers, the research nurses, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Undergraduate students, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that they will, will will pick the other segment, and then we can see that you are um, joining us. That's very nice. So we see that about a hundred people uh, also chose the results and I think that it's time that we just show the results because they will start moving uh, all along. So mm -hmm. can we please uh, take a look uh, at the Slido results. Entering 160, 170, we're, we're at, yeah, almost 200 people. Not the results yet. So we cannot show them Yet, I suppose, maybe, is somebody here who wants to, yeah, there, there we are, somebody's somewhere there are showing. <laughs> Lots of PhD students. <laughs> we cannot see them. Yeah, maybe we can see it there. on my screen as well. Left there, up there. There you can see it, yes. 190. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And, oh, and do we, do you all, all, can we also see, <laughs> do you have very strong glasses to find the results? Maybe, is it possible that we show our results as well on our small screen here? I'm asking director. Yeah. No, so, okay. so, so there, there are a lot of PhD P students, right? Yeah, PhD. Yeah. PhD is this the PhD largest and, group? PhD and graduate students. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And uh, that's also normal happening. All yeah. right. Okay, there we are. There we are. PhD, master student. The other category is, is also quite strongly involved oh, yeah. here. Faculty but members. That's only three percent. But ten percent principal investigators. Yes. That's good. Is that good? Yeah. Why do you say that's good? Well, I think I think we have about 15% of the entire community, so that means that about 60% of our principal investigators are on board. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's a good result, right? So now we're very interested as well to find out uh, how many editions of this Amsterdam Neuroscience Annual Meeting you have visited already. Maybe maybe all five. Maybe is your first one. Huh. We will find out strongly. This is my first one. That's fast. Two. <laughs> Thank you for voting, because this is interesting to know. How many did you attend? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to category at more least, than at five. Least, at least all five, yes. Yes, because we end here at five. Why do we do that? I think we, of course, we kick-started yeah. again with uh, Amsterdam Neuroscience in 2016. So this is officially the okay. fifth meeting of Amsterdam Neuroscience. Yes, all right. This is the official fifth. Yeah, yeah so it's just... A special meeting, you, right? How many did you attend? Oh, five. Five, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, that, that's better. <laughs> They're good. Let's see. But many of them say that this is their first time around, which is also good because you always need new attendees, right? And participants. Yep. And four. Yeah, there's a crowd there of all five. Yeah. It's a well-known meeting. Lovely. Yeah, we, we're very happy that you're joining us for the first or the fifth time. doesn't matter. Um, we have another question for you. So this is a one-word question, which is always very difficult. We know that you can do it, bright people. In one word, what is your main reason to participate today? So what are you looking for, hoping for? What are you interested in? What is your longing? An internship. Hey, hey look at that. <laughs> so is this mm. the right place to look for an internship? Sure. I am? Sure, you get exposed to uh, a lot of stories, so you can get a feel for what is your favorite topic. Yeah. And then you can connect. Yes, oh, that's good, that's good. Also, knowledge. I like, I like the fun also. I saw a fun. It's fun small still, but knowledge is And somebody's, somebody's looking for Linda Dow, which well, is also, yeah. that's, that's lovely. We're Who is all it? looking for Linda yeah. Dow. <laughs> we are. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think that I can predict that we will find her today. So that is, that is beautiful. Science, an update, yes, of course. That is, that is very important. Discovering. Brains. Looking for brains. <laughs> we have them here, I can assure you. It's lovely. Good. Networking, curiosity. Nice words, huh? Is there a word you miss? No, I think we're getting there. Inspiration, mm -hmm. like a lot. Update. Yeah, good. 
Yeah. So while I'm asking uh, the participants to answer the next question, I want to ask you this one, because we're going to ask you to describe uh, the past six months in the coronial era, <laughs> um, as they call it now, uh, in one word, please. And I would ask you the same, Diederik. What do you think? What would describe? What word would describe everything that happened? Well, may maybe crisis, right? Crisis, yes. Yeah, true. Was it um, a, for you personally a crisis as well? Yeah, for me personally as well, mm -hmm. but even more for society, I think, mm -hmm. for the research. Um, can you can you uh, elaborate on that a little? What was the crisis for research, especially? Well. Well, so so when in, in in March the first patients came in here in the Netherlands, then mm -hmm. the hospitals needed to take care of these patients. Sure. And uh, as a reaction, they uh, well they they halted all research. Yes. Except for the COVID nineteen research. Exactly. So um, people had to work at home, finishing stuff. But after two weeks, you finished stuff. Labs were closed. Wait. It, it, for research, wait. it was really crisis. Yeah. Really crisis, yes. And, uh, uh, but for society as well, I think. Mm -hmm. the, bi the biggest word uh, the, the, that people uh, tell us is, is challenging. Most people say so. Was it challenging for you as well? I think it was a shock. A shock, that's yeah. a good word as well. I didn't see it coming that way. No. When, when well, we, we saw it coming, but yeah. I hadn't realized it was that serious. Uh, nobody could have realized the impact before, right? No. What, what did it do to your daily uh, practice? Well, we, you know, we, we are an institute with 26 departments, so we are already a lot in virtual mode. Mm -hmm. We shifted uh, directly to home working uh, uh, devices, etc. Yeah. We but we were still, you know, doing business as usual. So we were still in the middle of a merger of two medical schools. Yes. And we tried to help the deans and the vice dean to, to you know, manage the crisis and still also have a long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, it's it's just an insecure. We are now at the beginning of a second wave, and yes. so that so then they ask us for advice of you know which labs should we close, what is a good percentage to have in the in the labs? Yep. Do we do we have to work in shifts, for instance, starting six o'clock in the morning, etc. Yeah. Yes. What are the decisions that you are facing right now? Yeah. Yeah. This next chapter. Yeah, mm. so uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. Mm. So uh, prepare for the worst. So mm. uh, what does that mean in your case? Well, I think as a physician, you have to make, take, well, be sure that you can take care of the patients. Yeah, sure, of course. And uh, I m maybe that's the first thing to do. And uh, for now, we also want to not only for the COVID patients, we want to keep the uh, the healthcare okay, mm -hmm. but also for for the rest of the patients, so the patients with cancer, and uh, that's quite a struggle. Yep. And yes. uh, so, as a physician, that's that that's that's a difficult choice to make. This. And yes. uh, and then, as a director of the institute, you're concerned about the research and uh, what what will happen. Uh, do we uh, again have to stop the research or, or can we continue with the clinical research and the lab research? You still don't know. Yeah. Mm. And then as a researcher, that's a different story. I mean, in, uh, in March we had to quit research and, and the complete team, we shifted from, from meningitis to COVID research. Right. So we will continue our COVID research. So that's an, that's an exciting Thing. That's the exciting bit, part. No, it, of course. It sounds a bit strange, yeah, no, but it's, it's, a, fine, yeah. it's a completely new disease. It is, yes. Yeah. New things every new, day. Yeah, yeah and a new phase. Well, in this studio, we try to uh, flatten the curve as much as we can, of course. Everybody's wearing masks when they move around. We try to clean everything, and uh, there are very little people here. People have to, to stay out bef uh, just and come in just before uh, they have a, a part here. So we're doing our very best and uh, we wish you all the best with that. Maybe we can, we can show the results of, the, of, the, of that one word question of Slido once more so we can include this so, so we can see what people said that it's been to them in the last uh, six months. And uh, if, if that's not possible, we will switch to uh, the next question. And that is, and I want to talk to you about that, team science. Oh, yes. 
How would you... Oh, here, oh, here are the words again. Good. Stressful. Yes. Has it been stressful? Probably. Lonely, somebody says. And somebody entered Linda Dow again. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> well, she's, she's one of the speakers in, the, in, the, in this coming session. I know, I know. Yeah. But, but who's, the, who's the one saying that also the last six months were only about Linda Dow for, Maybe him, for him or her? Of, uh, Maybe a, a loved one. It's yeah. prob it, that, that would be nice. That would be romantic then. <laughs> uh, so it's been exhausting for you, people say. It's been unexpected, well, everything, well, we all know the feelings. Okay, how would you uh, describe team science in one word is what we're going to ask them. And that is the theme of the day and of the annual meeting. Absolutely. Can you please define team science for me? Well, I think if you put your own interest aside yeah. for whatever good, good reason and you, you actually join forces and have a main a con a consensus on the focus that you work on. Mm -hmm. So but th that's kind of an intention? That's an intention, yes, that's true. And I think what we do in the Institute is we work uh, already with, uh, let's say, translational teams. That mm -hmm. means that a neurologist joins together, let's say, with someone from clinical genetics or with an infectionologist, and then you get, you get transdisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. And probably that is the only way that you can solve real uh, problems in, in health and disease. Complicated matters. Well, I think, you know, the brain is a complicated organ. Yeah. <laughs> and so you need different type of specialists and disciplines in order to, to address that organ, if you're curious. But then on top of that, there's this purpose-oriented, uh, you know, disease-oriented research. Mm -hmm. And we are very much, uh, you know, um, aiming for solving also brain diseases. Of course. And the only way to do that is to to work in teams. And why is that new or kind of new? Well, I think, you know, old school, you had, uh, let's say, strong principal investigators. Yeah. They all had their own teams mm -hmm. and they were in competition. Yeah. The competition is always And I think here. what you see now nowadays is, you know, we have to share data. You have to work with global uh, consortia and you yeah. have to share the knowledge and, and also cross borders. And that is, I think, what, what is team science for do, me. Do people share knowledge enough already? Well, I Data. think you can always do better. Yeah. Um, Still the competition part that prevents us from sharing? I think so, yeah. yeah. So, and it's, it's strange, right? So mm. we work with public money. Mm -hmm. We work with patients. You do. And these patients want the science to get them better, mm. right? Mm -hmm. to, uh, to improve healthcare or improve knowledge. And then you, 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 you sit on your own data. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. Yes, can it have something to do with, with funding and reputation? I, I, yes, I think so. So also it also it also depends. So, so in our team, we we share all the data we yeah. generate, and and that's also something you saw with COVID times. So, uh, on one side, COVID was really stressful, as as the all the viewers uh, said was well, stressful, yes, sad, scary. That that's all true. Yeah. But it also brought focus in research. So. Yep. Uh, what you see now in COVID research, it's really team science. So we exactly. we publish papers with, with, with hundreds, or Everybody hundreds shares. of authors. All papers are, are, are so freely available. The team science yeah. uh, intention is served by COVID a little. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's very special. So you've been working on something else in the last year, right? Well, I think it's a, it's a good way to, to introduce now the magazine. Yeah, it's good to um, Because the magazine actually, uh, you know, it's, it is really focused around team science. Yeah. And what we did there, and then maybe we can get this yeah, magazine. Yeah, we said team science to, to on, everybody here is progressive, complement, and... Yeah. The, Fun. Fun also. <laughs> Lots, yeah. Yeah, knowledge, sharing, yes, that's what it is. But we're going to take a look at the magazine, right? Yes, if we can. That would be lovely, yes. We'll because have, we'll this, is the, this is actually the second edition. Last year we did this for the first time. Yeah. Um, and, and, and last year we actually we talked already about team science. There it is. There it is, we see Hilgo What a Brian. beautiful cover. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and a new motto also, yeah. connecting Con the yeah. people. Connecting the can people. Can we go back to the cover, please? Yes. Um, because this is very important. Connecting the people, the science and the brain. So this is our new motto yeah. for the next five years, I would say. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, is and, it? And so there is also um, a website with that, connecting uh, the brain. So what you see on the, on the magazine actually is already team science, right? You see a team active uh, around the patient. And here you see uh, eight other teams that are featured in this magazine. So three major features. Mm -hmm. Uh, and six profiles, and I think uh, each time you see, you know, we do corona distance photography, but you see uh, we, we go really into the storytelling of 
what team science is. And it is available of today, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And you can find it on connectingthebrain.nl. So here you have my friend Diederik on yeah. the ball. <laughs> yeah. Very good. With his Beautiful team. pictures. And then if you flip further, please. Um, yes, and then so you got the second major feature and also the step up to the Swammerdam mm -hmm. lecture today. So yes, this true. is Hilfe Still Browning and yeah. his team. Yeah. Uh, you see real yeah. team science, you know, there's no, I mean, uh, I think Hilgo is the primus in the paris, he was the one who generated the idea, but there were people happy of stepping off their own main focus and then joining him as a team. And it will be a great presentation uh, today. The yeah, we look forward to yeah, the lecture, lecture. Yeah. Yeah, 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 probably. It's going to be flashy. Yes, it will be. At, at 12.30, we, yeah. we will have the Swammerdam lecture. Yeah. We, uh, and maybe, will be there. maybe if I can say a couple of things. One you know, more, yeah. there, there, was, there was a major team working on this magazine. Mm -hmm. Marike Buis did all the major profiles, and Naomi Fostermans did all the profiles in the six portraits. And, you know, we work with the professional team, and uh, I'm very happy that I work with them. Good, good. That's mm. good to know that you are happy. Well, uh, and it's beautiful. People will read it. And uh, I want to thank you for now. Thank you very because much. Because we will be seeing a lot of you during the day. You'll be here. You'll be keeping a close eye on us. Thank you very much. Interfering every time, right? And you will be uh, walking towards uh, your new chairs. And you'll be the Absolutely. Waldorf and Stadler of the day. Uh, you can always uh, uh, call on us when we do something wrong, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, good. So, uh, and for now, uh, let's please uh, uh, switch to our four scientists. Uh, with us Gijs Kooi, uh, Mark Engelen, Linda Douw and Mirjam van Zuiden. Uh, so, Gijs Kooi, you're an assistant professor uh, molecular cell biology and immun immunology. Exactly. And your colleagues tell me that you are an open-minded researcher, always in for discussion, open for discussion, and that you're quite brave because you're never afraid to ask for help or expertise anywhere. That's true. Is it true? <laughs> 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 he just agrees. That's the I right agree. thing to do. Yes, and uh, Mark, uh, you are a pediatric neurologist. And lovely right. that you're here as well. You are here today to discuss what you, uh, what you, you call yourself uh, quite practical. And you're, you're, you're going to talk about practi quite practical research also, yes. right? Absolutely. will be very easy to follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out later if that is true, because you, you are able to explain it in a clear way, I see. And uh, Linda, you're an associate professor, uh, professor anatomy and neurosciences, and you are a clinical neuropsychologist. Correct. Yes. People tell me that you are outspoken and to the point. Yeah, we'll be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and that you're able to explain complicated matters in a very bright and clear way. Well, that will definitely test. <laughs> that, that, that be, yeah. That'll be tested, yes, yes it's true. And uh, Miriam van Zuiden, you're an assistant professor of psychiatry in the Amsterdam UMC, right? And you uh, are famous for asking the right questions and convincing and inspiring, they say. Nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. good, huh? <laughs> good start of the day. The art of asking the right questions, that is very, very important, I think. So, f just, just a short reaction. How is this uh, time to live in the corona area for you? Gijs. Yeah, it's challenging. I think one of the points that uh, was brought up is uh, definitely the case. Uh, I think this, this holds true for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we all have to adapt to this new situation. And um, for us as a scientist, but also if you teach, you know, that it, it's completely different than we did before. So it's it's challenging in, in one word. Yeah, Linda? Yeah, I agree with that. And also it brings a lot of connection. I do think it's di more difficult to connect, but I do see that there's a lot happening there. But there's more connection, you say? In a way, because oh, you're good. trying to support each other more than normal. Ah, that's a good development. Would yeah. you agree, Miriam? Yeah, I think there's a lot more understanding and acceptance mm. at some points that things may not go the way you want to go. Ah. You want them to go, but yeah, but it's unpredictable. It mm -hmm. is, it is. Yeah. So the art of accepting things the way they are, do you think so too? Yes, that absolutely. That you learned that in this? <coughs> and uh, I also find it quite interesting to see <laughs> everything that's been happening the past few months. Interesting. Uh, I, at least I would have not expected it to have such a major impact. No. Yeah. 
and now you learn to deal with cameras and uh, be in a, in a studio. Yeah, and, that's and, an added bonus. And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Huh? And work with online participants because we have the man for you. We also have because you will be presenting research, all of you, and then we'll discuss it uh, later. You also have an online panel to listen to your uh, research and presentations, and they will discuss it. Let me introduce them, and maybe we can see them. That would be very lovely. Um, uh, Rick van der Kant will be joining us. Eline Willemsen, Zoe van Kempen, Diederik, he's here, he's there. Uh, yeah, there they are. Hi, everyone. Maybe you can raise your hand if it's you when I, when I, when I uh, say your name. So, Rick van der Kant. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Nice to have you here. He's an assistant professor, research associate neurology. Uh, we have Eline Willemsen. Hi. <laughs> Postdoctoral researcher, research associate, clinical chemistry. Welcome. We have neurologist Zoe van Kempen. Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> good. This is very good. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mathen Kahn, assistant professor. Hi, there you are. And Fleur van Rootselaar, medical specialist. Yes, neurology. Betty Times. Betty? Yes, associate professor, neurology as well. Wiesje van der Vlier. Yeah, in the middle, there she is. F uh, she is a professor in neurology. And we have Tinka Polderman, associate professor of child psychiatry. Hi, hi, good morning. Welcome that you're here. They're going to listen to uh, you presenting closely and they'll uh, ask you for questions afterwards. But what we do want from you people at home is that you also um, ask questions. From uh, the moment we start, just right now, you can start submitting questions in the Slido app. And you can also, and this is very important, vote for questions you see other people entered. And if you think that's a good one, good question, the art of asking good questions, you just give them a, a, a Facebook kind a like, a thumbs up, and then the, the most important questions will be selected automatically. So they'll be asked to our speakers. So you can start asking your questions uh, right now in the business development team is already starting that. Okay, let's start uh, um, your uh, research uh, developments uh, sharing uh, with the first presenter. Um, I asked them to explain it to me, not the expert, uh, their, their investigations, and I think that I have uh, found a way to understand because the first presentation will be also about how does inflammation become chronic, finding out what might help coordinate and prevent that in the body. Exactly. Very curious. Go ahead. Gijs yeah, me. thank you very much. So uh, I would like to uh, give an overview of my uh, research, um, which is uh, reflected by this image you can see on the screen. So um, we look at uh, MS patients, multiple sclerosis, and what we see in these patients is that they have these chronic inflammatory uh, lesions in the brain, which you can see here also in the, in the image in the, the red dots. And we, I would like to use our own body's own protection mechanism in order to, um, to resolve this. So just to recap for the people who are not familiar with this disease, uh, it's multiple sclerosis, it's a chronic inflammatory disease of the central nervous system. Uh, basically what happens is that the immune system, here indicated by uh, purple cells, uh, enter the brain and cause tissue damage. So they eat up these protection sheets around uh, the nerve fibers. And this leads to a loss of function of, of many things. Think about cognitive problems, but also physical problems. Uh, most of these people end up in a wheelchair, for example. So this is the most common disabling disease of, of young adults. It actually hits these people in the prime of their life. So we, we should do something about this. Uh, to visualize this entry of these immune cells, I have made a, a, a short movie of this. Uh, in the middle, you can see a blood vessel, so this, this white area in the middle. Um, in red, you have these nerve fibers, and in green is the myelin, the protection sheet. So this is in a healthy situation, looks normal on the MRI. However, in MS, we see these cells from the immune system entering the brain and starting to eat up this protective uh, layer. And this is causing the damage, of course, in the brain. And you can also visualize that on the MRI. You can see here the, the characteristic white spots uh, uh, in MS patients. But also, if we look at this in time, and I think this is a really interesting movie. This is weekly MRI scans of an MS patient to also show you what is happening in the brain in a patient throughout the year. So there is a lot of activity. We see a lot of different lesions popping up uh, in, inside his brain. Some of them resolve, some of them stay. Um, there is a lot of inflammation going on and it's also uh, in different areas of the brain. So the biggest question we actually want to answer is how does this inflammatory reaction becomes chronic? And for that, we need to know 
know how a normal reaction uh, is resolved. So I've put it into this um, uh, simplified scheme of a normal inflammatory reaction. So, for example, if you, you have a wound, uh, you will have some bleeding, you get immune cells over there to clear up the site and get back to uh, homeostatic functions. Uh, this is also indicated here by the green line, so you have an inflammatory phase, and once this, um, this threat has been uh, removed, you get a resolution phase, and this is, in order, this is needed in order to uh, resolve tissues in their normal and uh, functional state, and in the case of the brain, to get a healthy brain, of course. However, in MS, we see this other phase, so this, this red line uh, entering this more chronic inflammatory situation, and we believe this is because this resolution phase, or this normal recovery phase, is not properly functioning. And important to mention is a resolution uh, this is orchestrated by lipid mediators, so they are derived from polyunsaturated fatty acids like, like omega-3. So mm. now you also know why you have to eat a lot of fish. Um, and this is something we have recently discovered. And also that the beginning programs the end. So if you fool around in the beginning of, a good, of an, an uh, inflammatory response, you will also fool around in the resolution response. And this is important if you think about treatment, because the currently used treatments are mostly anti-inflammatory drugs. They work pretty well uh, in suppressing this ongoing inflammation, but in the end, all these patients still progress into the more progressive phases of the disease. And this is because stop fooling around in this early phase, you also block this resolution phase. So you will never get a good uh, recovery response. So in my research, we try to identify those resolution defects in the case of MS, but also in other uh, neurological diseases. Not only to provide uh, novel diagnostic tools, so use these, these lipid, bio, uh, lipid mediates as a biomarker, so uh, for patient certification, but also to see whether, when a patient uh, goes to the next phase of the disease, for example. But also to provide a novel way of treatment in the end, so boost this resolution, so identify the defects and then Re uh, restore this in order to boost resolution and then bring this red arrow back to the, the green situation. And thereby uh, basically provide a change in diagnosis and the treatment, uh, but also provide a way for all the clinicians that are, that are looking here today, which make, make use of, of uh, inflammation pharmacology, that there might be also another option uh, which we are uh, exploring uh, these days. So this is in a nutshell uh, yes. what I would like to press, present. But but very, very clear. So uh, the, this is that, that that's bad news for the vegan people amongst us. No, I think the vegan people still. Uh, the, you know, you can you can supplement, of course, with yeah. uh, with uh, pills and uh, stuff like that. So they should do that. They definitely. should. You yeah, have yeah. to supplement, and otherwise you <laughs> get the, the, the fat the fat kind of fish. Is it yes, right? Yes, yes, like that's the mackerel and exactly. salmon and yeah. Ah, oh, not, not, not a punishment, right? No, definitely <laughs> no. not. Let, let, let's go to your online panel. And, and people at home or in the office or wherever you are, please enter your questions. You can ask Gijs now, right away, in Slido, there off or on your phone with the event code. Please enter your questions, then we will try and let them answer. Um, so, let me see. Rick van der Kant, maybe you have a question. <laughs> Hi. Very nice, uh, very nice talk, uh, guys. I love to Thank see you. those images that you uh, show. Yeah. Um, so my question is uh, a little bit: um, wh Why do you think that this, uh, in these patients, the, the inflammation does not resolve? Uh, and do I understand that correctly? You think that actually the drugs that they are given actually inhibit this uh, resolving of the inflammation, or is it also in the genetics or the the diet of these patients that uh, that could affect this? Yeah, so this, this resolution defects that we found is, we think it's in the machinery in making these protective lipid mediators. So um, there have been done studies uh, with diet, so supplementing uh, MS patients with uh, omega-3, for example. But that's not completely sure whether it works. But if you think that the machinery is not properly functioning, you can supplement whatever you want. Uh, so I don't think that's the way. I think we should supplement with the the ones that are missing, so the, the real lipid mediators that do this protective phase. And actually we find in patients a lot of defects in these systems, uh, and not only in MS, also in other diseases which have chronic inflammatory phenotype, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, you can also see uh, defects, but it's disease specific. So um, hmm. depending on the, on the location uh, and the type of tissue, you have a, a certain signature of uh, lipid mediators. Yes, before we go to uh, Eline, because she has uh, your next question already, we have one question from Sanne, and many people want to know the answer. To Gijs, which disease model do you use? Yeah, so we mostly use the, so we mostly focus on uh, MS, so we use the EAE model, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. 
Wow, uh, but can you we... repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> EAE. EAE, yeah, that's, that's better. Uh, that's yeah. the, the easiest name. And then yeah. uh, this is more the, the inflammatory model of the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have Cuprisan mice, which is more the, the, the more progressive, uh, mimics more the progressive phase of the disease. So basically we do both, uh, both types. Thanks, that's clear. Eline, Willem, sir, what's your question? Welcome. <laughs> Uh, yes, guys, thanks for your talk. I think it's very interesting work that you do. And um, I was thinking about these defects in um, the resolution machinery. Do you think this really uh, is sort of a cause of MS, uh, or would it be more a downstream effect that we could use for diagnosis and, and uh, therapy? Yeah, it's a really good question. So at, at this stage, I don't know yet. So we're we're looking into this also uh, at a genetic le level, but also epigenetic levels uh, to see whether these enzymes that are involved in the production of these uh, uh, lipid mediators are already uh, affected really early in the disease. So the earliest patients possible that we get. So I cannot answer that question yet. Um, so that, that has to be resolved in the coming uh, years. Mm, yes. Okay, yes. Is that good for you? He needs time. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> are there already any uh, genetic studies that that uh, Good. done in MS? Yeah, so the GWAS studies don't show, uh, uh, there are only a, a few SNPs uh, known in a couple of the enzymes involved in the production of these enzymes, uh, but it's not uh, complete. And I think it's more in the epigenetic regulation of the enzymes, but that's something we, we are currently testing. Okay, good. Because also Dilek uh, wants to know which stage of development your research is now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so That's it's, it. it's really preclinical still, so it's fundamental. So we first have to identify what is wrong in the patients, and yeah. then we have, uh, by supplementing this in in vivo models, we provide proof of principle that, mm -hmm. that this could be the way to uh, resolve MS. And so it's really early stage. Uh, really early stage. Uh, yeah, so we have done a, a, quite a lot of uh, animal experiments already on. Uh, by supplementing this, this uh, boosting this resolution, and it works pretty well. Good. Uh, so the next step will be to go to the clinic. Yeah, and you have big plans with it, right? If I saw your presentation. <laughs> yes, I heard you humming, Arjen. Well, I think, you know, this is great. Mm. So I think you need to start at the basics. And so this, I, I was just interested to see whether you are going to stick to the EAE model or did you also going to use the Cuprison model, for instance, and other models? Yeah, so we, we did already uh, some experiments in the Cuprison model. Uh, so we are expanding this, yeah, to uh, m multiple models. All right. I have another question from Till. Thank you all for entering your questions here. And many people want to know, uh, will all lesions be targeted by your lipid-based therapy, since the lesions are so plastic and heterogeneous? Yeah, so th that's a really good question, of course. Um, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have found so far is that these uh, lipid mediators can uh, regulate the, the migration of cells into the central nervous system. So the mostly inflammatory lesions can be targeted in that way. But we also found that the local uh, immune cells of the brain, the microglia, are really uh, responsive to these kinds of lipid mediators. So it's also local effects uh, that, uh, that can be suppressed because mm. microglial activation is one of the key hallmarks of uh, MS. So it's, it's, a, it's dual. It's dual. Okay. Uh, multiple, uh, yeah. That's the right answer. Diederik. So you nicely show the temporal relation, right, of uh, the temporal process of MS. And then you say, well, lots of factors are important, and then you should not block the immune cells early, right? Mm -hmm. But then you only focus on the lipids. So why don't, probably, like, it's, a, it's an interplay, right, between these immune cells and the lipids. And mm -hmm. we're talking about team science today. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sure. I think multiple sclerosis yeah, research definitely. is really team science. And uh, so are you uh, teaming up with people from T regulatory cells, studying T regulatory cells or other yes. cells of the immune yes. system yes. to study the, the interaction between the lipids and the immune cells? Definitely. So, th so this, this project is, is, is like, the, I think, the perfect example of team science. So uh, during the different postdocs that I did before this, I, I went abroad, I went to different labs to, to learn these kinds of, uh, like lipidomics and also other aspects of, the, of this. Uh, so we look in now with an, an international team to many aspects of this, this uh, resolution phase and focusing on immune cells, but also on local cells and where are these lipids produced? Mm -hmm. How does that work? So many aspects are, are currently uh, investigated. Yeah. So it's a, it's a 
Good thing. Through Team Science projects. Team Science yeah. is, 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 is happening. Definitely. That's, that's good. Um, but the, the good news is that we have more questions coming in. Everybody's warming up now, so be, <laughs> be fast next round, uh, which is very nice. But you, we, you still have the chance to answer Definitely. many questions because at 12 o'clock there'll be breakout sessions, and these four people will be in their own breakout sessions, and then you can discuss matters just with a little more time. That would be nice. So, Merel and Paul, <laughs> thank you for entering your questions. Just go to the breakout session uh, at 12 o'clock, right? Good. Good, thank you so much. <laughs> let's let's uh, proceed to uh, our next uh, researcher, Mark Engele. Um, yes, if a patient says to a doctor, I'm getting worse, what does that mean? What do we know? We know too little then. What do we have to measure to know what's really going on? Uh, Proceed, Mark Engele. Thank you. That's uh, what I'm focusing on. Um, yes. So, uh, in the Department of Neurology, um, we try to develop treatments for rare diseases. But before you can um, develop a treatment or evaluate the treatment, you need to know the natural history of the disease. And you need to be able to measure disease severity. And that is something that we've been focusing on the last few, ye few years and that I would like to illustrate the next few minutes. So, um, we are the expert center for paroxysomal metabolic disorders, and these are uh, rare disorders of which we have relatively large groups of patients. And we've been doing a natural history study for the past five years. And uh, that group of patients is now known internationally as the Dutch cohort. And we have been using this disease as a model uh, for the measuring disease severity that we hope that we can generalize to other disorders. So why is this disease suitable as a model? It's because its core pathology in adulthood is relatively simple. It's myelopathy due to axonal degeneration of very selective long tracts of the dorsal columns, the ones in blue on, on the screen. That's a descend of an ascending tract that mainly carries proprioceptive information. And the uh, um, uh, corticospinal tracts that are important in, in voluntary movement. And if these, these tracts are damaged, you get a coordination disorder that we call sensory ataxia, and you get spasticity, stiff limbs with also muscle weakness. And that causes a very severe gait disorder, which is very debilitating for these patients in adulthood. But this pathology is very predictable and therefore useful to study. So um, there are many pharmaceutical companies now who have small molecules that they would like to offer as a treatment for adrenal leukodystrophy. And there's also companies that are pretty far along in developing AAV9 gene therapy. But the problem, of course, is when you want to introduce a new treatment, you need to prove its efficacy. And clinical trials for ALD and many other similar diseases are very difficult. And that is because disease progression is very slow, developing over years or decades, which is, of course, difficult because you need very long clinical trials, five years or more. And because patients are very different, there's an enormous variability. Those that are wheelchair-bound in their early 20s to those that are still ambulatory at 75. And of course, that you simply do not have that many patients. And that is compounded by yeah, our current limitations, because neurologists are very good in diagnosing myelopathy. We have been doing that for over 100 years. We just need our little reflex hammer and a tuning fork. But we're not very good in quantifying it, because our uh, examination is very qualitative and not so quantitative. So people have been working for many years on developing measurements and tests to, to, to do something about that. And a famous and practical one is the six-minute walk test. And it's really as easy as uh, you think. You let somebody walk on a standardized track for six minutes and you measure how many meters were traveled. The problem is that measures like that are not specific because if somebody has a painful foot or tight-fitting shoes, it will affect the score, which is, of course, not due to the underlying disease. Um, it's not sensitive. You need to deteriorate quite a bit before we are able to measure it. And it has clear floor and ceiling effects. So there are patients uh, who are very little symptoms who score maximum and patients who are um, severely affected and will score minimum um, even if they progress further. So you lose a lot of patients. So for that, it means we need for efficient trials for our treatments, we need new outcome measures that will directly measure the pathology we're interested in, in this case, axonal loss in the long tracts, um, that are very sensitive, so trials can be done rapidly, and preferably without a floor and ceiling effect, so everybody will be eligible to participate. And we've been borrowing heavily from other fields, talking about team science, 
Um, so we, um, we use imaging, uh, mostly MRI scans, but also optical coherence tomography to measure the thickness of the retina that is borrowed from the MS field. Uh, uh, we try to improve the functional test, like the six-minute walk test, by, by looking at balance. And of course, we also jumped on the wet uh, biomarker bandwagon. So to um, briefly uh, show what we've done over the last two years, um, I can, uh, spoiler alert, we haven't solved the problem, but we've made some small steps forward. Um, we've used quantitative MRI to look at the, the volume of the spinal cord. And as expected, you see, um, well, I can't point it out, but you, you see in, in the little yellow breakout boxes that uh, the spinal cord of ALD patients is very thin and flattened. And we could also we could show that this correlates well with disease severity and it's easy to measure. But the problem is asymptomatic patients do not differ from symptomatic patients, the top two curves. So this does not qualify as the perfect marker. And also it doesn't change over a period of two years. So we tried a different technique, DTI. It's a little bit better. Now we can distinguish asymptomatic patients from controls. And also it changes over a period of two years but still the difference are so, are so small, you still need large groups. So um, then we've been looking at refining the six minute walk test. So by looking at balance, because if your spinal cord does, everybody wobbles when you stand, uh, but when um, your spinal cord is defective, you wobble more, especially if you make it difficult with eyes closed, so you have no visual correction. And this is very sensitive in also picking up patients who say they are asymptomatic. They still wobble more than controls. So this is something that we hope uh, will be a step forward. And I would like to briefly illustrate how we do that. Um, I hope somebody can start the video because I don't have a button. Ah, great. So this is the, the way we used to do it. You can see uh, this, he, has very, he has trouble standing upright, uh, even with his feet apart. And uh, it just takes 30 seconds. And now, this year, we started with a new system. It's hard to see, but he has six sensors, uh, six small Apple Watches-like devices on his body. And we can measure the same without needing additional equipment. And the great thing is you can also have them do the six-minute walk test, but you get extra information. Also, um, for instance, turning speed, which we think might be interesting, and, uh, and all kinds of other parameters. So I think it's finished now. So, as for the wet biomarkers, again, not very original, but we borrowed it from um, the neurodegenerative diseases field. But it, it also seems that um, compounds in plasma and CSF correlate with disease severity, and we'll have to see if that is useful. So, um, for those interested in uh, learning more, we occasionally publish uh, some pictures. Thank you. You're also on Instagram. <laughs> well, not me, but one of my fellow <laughs> investigators is uh, very interested in this kind of stuff, and I gladly uh, make use of that. Yeah, and then yeah. we have these nice clips and, and images, probably. Yeah. So this was uh, Mark's presentation. Um, listen, Slido, where you can still enter questions. We will archive all the questions that were for the last presenter, for Gijs. And now you can enter new ones, and you can also just respond. If you want to make a comment or a compliment or something, just do so uh, you're welcome with everything there uh, and then we can we can we can, we can uh, change from questions from the panel to you uh, in your office or at home so even Kempe do you have a question well um, then I would also like to start with a compliment Good. <laughs> mark a really nice presentation and I think this is also really um, showing uh, that we're all doing the same thing also in the, the field of MS. I think everybody's looking for biomarkers, radiological markers and everything. Um, so you briefly mentioned also o OCT that you, uh, that you use to uh, measure the, the thickness of the retinal layer. If you use OCT, because I think the pathology is mainly in the spinal cord, um, would you also consider of using brain atrophy in uh, ALD? Oh, well, first of all, yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, well, we, we, we've thought about brain atrophy, but um, luckily for these patients, they don't have any. Even the, the older okay. patients are not very different from our healthy controls. Okay, but good. for me, it was a revelation that healthy controls um, also have quite significant atrophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so good to know. Yeah. yeah. Well. And Mark, if I... Um, um, because you also um, look at the biomarkers, but as you mentioned, it's a really, really slow progressive disease. 
And I think it's really good that you're looking for biomarkers for studies. Um, still, do you think you will find something that will really make a difference in two years if the clinical progression is so slow? Yeah. Hmm. The honest answer? <laughs> no. I, 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 <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, <laughs> Like you, I've become a little skeptical. I think we can improve a lot over our conventional tools, but mainly um, that, that we can reduce variation and that we, um, that we can make it easier for patients. But like you, I think it, in diseases like this, it, it's, it, it's going to take two years to do a clinical trial. Yeah. So we have a, we have a, a Slido question here from Matthew Kahn, but he's in the panel as well. <laughs> what will make it to the clinic, quantitative MRI or the smartwatch? Ah, mm. well, both, I hope. Yeah. Uh, no, they, they both have their, their strengths and weaknesses. The, the great things, because, well, Matan worked with us on the quantitative MRI, so he also knows the limitations. But the great thing is you don't need patient cooperation. Also, somebody in a wheelchair, you can put them in the scanner. It doesn't take that long, and you get your data. Mm. For also, for the smartwatches, you need somebody who's able to walk. You need somebody who's motivated. So basically, in an ideal trial, I would do both. Mm. Um, but um, if, if you want to, you know, to, to reduce your floor and ceiling effect, the MRI is better at this time. OK. Thank yeah. you. That's clear. Diederik, do you have something that you want to Yeah, so ask? Mark, we know each other for a long time. <laughs> so I <laughs> can ask you a critical that. question, right? <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, I will do it. Yeah, please. Um, so, uh, of course, we know all these pharmaceutical companies, they ask lots of money, right, for these, uh, for these treatments. And yep. uh, they must be very interesting for you in your research, squeezing out very small changes over time. And, uh, but, I mean, you can ridiculize, of course, the seven-minute walking test by uh, narrow-fitting shoes. But, it, I mean, if you, if you walk... Hmm. Shorter is clinically relevant. Yeah. So what, what what about your measurements? What's cl clinically relevant, or or is it used by pharmaceutical companies to squeeze in their expensive medication because <laughs> these, these patients want to be treated? Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Respond, well, please. they're not using it yet, but but you are absolutely right. They uh, you can see some logos on my last slide. They are very very interested in in in, the, in this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and you're right, uh, of course we should uh, always remain critical if, to see if we, what we measure really represents something that is clinically relevant. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we are trying to do is validate the, these new measures by doing really long follow-up. And I do think if, if over time, eh, over five years, we can show that, that our relatively easy quick markers are really predictive and correlate well with those established clinically relevant markers, then then there might be a, a rationale to actually use them as, en as endpoints. But you're right, we have to be careful and, and not rush that because of financial interests that others might have. True. Good, thank you. So one, one, one more question from Slido, and, and please correct me if I say this in the wrong way. Dominic, thank you for your question, says, can you use NFL levels to measure the axonal degeneration? Is that right? Mm -hmm. In ALD, or is this not suitable, as it does not specify where the NFLs come from? Yeah, that that that. Um, to be honest, we, we of course we haven't really studied what the NFL comes from. We yeah. just established that in this degenerative disease, it is also increased, like in many other degenerative diseases. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's good. Yeah. That's a clear answer. So the same goes for you, Mark. You will have a breakout session, and if people want to know more and discuss your research a little more Sorry. and these matters that we just found, thank you for your slide of questions. Then you can just go to his breakout session and talk to him and drink a cup of coffee and just elaborate. Thanks so much for your thank presentation. You. Thank you. Now, Linda Dow, there is someone here yeah. uh, uh, watching, it's a funny person. viewing today. Yeah, he's very. It, it is a funny he person. He or she, I don't know. I don't you know you know really don't is. know. I really don't. Somebody, uh, his uh, the only uh, thing he desired from today was Linda Dow, and also here, the, the, here the, I am. the Corona era was all about you. Yes. Maybe you, you have to take a look in your camera and give this person a very lovely big smile. <laughs> I will try. I will try. <laughs> and also, if you are the one that was uh, uh, entering that, Linda Dow, all the time, you can, you can just make yourself known yeah. by entering your That'd name nice. in Slido, please. Okay, <laughs> tell us who you are, because we really want to know. <laughs> now, let's talk science. <laughs> let's do that. Yeah. So, uh, you discovered that there are big differences in the recovery of patients suffering from MS to brain tumors to cerebral infarction 
connection and um, you want to know more about that, um, uh, about the networks underlying yes. these differences. Go Correct. ahead. Yeah, so I'm very happy with the new motto of Amsterdam Neuroscience because I'm a network neuroscientist, so uh, thinking about connections and, and networks is really my thing. So Brain Layer is a project I'll talk about today, um, and it's based upon these three groups that you already identified, people with uh, cerebral infarctions, multiple sclerosis and glioma, so primary, primary brain tumors. And um, all these patients uh, have very different or pathological changes in their brain, as indicated here, and the incidence is also very different across, different, uh, across the Netherlands. But what they have in common is that they have cognitive deficits, or at least a very significant number of patients has. Uh, and we don't understand where, which patients have these cognitive deficits and how they progress over time. And it's important because these cognitive deficits have a very strong impact on how pa patients feel, so their quality of life, but also how they can participate in society. So basically the research is about understanding uh, this co cognitive decline and predicting it. Uh, and we do so by not focusing on the disease itself or the pathological lesions that these patients all have, but looking at the rest of the brain, uh, the brain network or the connectome. And what you see here is a very simplified version of the connectome in which each node is a region and each connection between, it is, uh, between two nodes is whether there is an anatomical or a functional connection. Um, and we can image that in different ways. Within Amsterdam Neuroscience, we really have the state-of-the-art uh, imaging modalities like magnetoencephalography or diffusion and resting state functional MRI. Um, so what we've learned from this is that optimal cognitive functioning in healthy subjects uh, really relates to how well organized this network is. So if it's efficiently organized, people do better on cognitive tasks and have a higher IQ. At the same time, we know that in healthy subjects, if you temporarily lesion a brain region, like this red node you see in the middle here, um, we can predict what happens to their cognitive functioning afterwards by looking at the network from before the TMS in this case, so the transcranial magnetic stimulation. So that means that the way that the brain network is organized also impacts the way it deals with a lesion. And that's also what we've seen in most patient studies. So we see that not only the way that the, uh, the region in which a lesion takes place uh, responds to this lesion, but also the rest of the brain, so the plastic effects that are widespread and can be very different, uh, distant from the different uh, from the lesion sites, they impact a lot how cognition changes over time. But that's all correlative, uh, and of course the aim would be to uh, predict this better in patients. Um, and to do so, I will use uh, a new uh, or an advanced um, innovative way of looking at these networks. So up to now, we've basically been looking at unilayer networks, which means that all these modalities, these imaging modalities that we have, we've been looking at separately and relating them to cognition in both health and disease. Uh, but there's a new branch of graph theory or network theory that consults uh, multilayer networks in which you can synergize between these different networks. So instead of looking at them separately or statistically, uh, we can form one big multidimensional multilayer with interactions between the different layers and really look at what um, uh, interactions are most predictive of cognitive functioning. Um, so that synergizes across all these different modalities. And we've already done some uh, work that is um, lead some pilot work that leads to these questions. Also very much team science. Uh, so in one project, which is an alliance grant from Amsterdam Neuroscience, we've collected most of these imaging uh, people from Amsterdam Neuroscience across the Amstel and looked at healthy controls and the way in which if you bring together, like we show here, the different modalities and also connect them between the different layers, uh, that we can uh, explain more cognitive variance in healthy people uh, than when looking at the modalities separately. And in another um, uh, Amsterdam Neuroscience project, we go from really the clinic to the very uh, fundamental CNCR type cell work um, to imaging in temporal lobe epilepsy patients. Um, and we try to understand whether the multilayer brain network could explain more cognitive variance uh, in particularly memory functioning that these temporal lobe patients suffer, suffer from. Um, so uh, we have a lot of... Um, oh, I think I, I would like to go back to the slides now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, what we plan to do after this is uh, to first of all um, use the multilayer network in order to virtually lesion different parts of this multilayer network through transcranial magnetic stimulation, then again look whether we can better predict what that will do to cognitive functioning in these healthy subjects. Mm -hmm. 
And we'll use three very unique patient cohorts, so patients with glioma, with multiple sclerosis, and with uh, uh, CVA, in order to, to see longitudinally whether these multilayer uh, network indices are better able to track cognitive decline, as indicated in the graph on the right, but also whether it can predict what will happen next. And of course, this will also be um, a very good segue into trying to determine treatment targets. So TMS, I've uh, sort of talked about it now as a way to virtually lesion and manipulate brain functioning, but we can also use it to treat if we know where to go. So that's what I hope to do. And in terms of team science, I tried to make a list of all the people that have contributed to this, <laughs> to this, which is way too long. I should make a network out of it, but I just want to highlight Lucas, Lucas Breed and uh, Fernando Nobrega Santos, who will be working mostly on this brain layer project. Maybe the, maybe one of them was the one that entered Linda Dow. I hope the, the that person no. still did, <laughs> didn't come forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, thank, you, thank you so much. This is this is your time to, to to add your comments and questions for Linda in Slido. Please do because we really like that. Um, let me see. There you are, Betty. Betty Times. Can you please ask your question for Linda? Uh, yes, of course. Linda, thank you for this great overview of the multi-layer network research you're going to do. And uh, so I was wondering, I noticed that you have mostly functional measures and DDI measures. And I was missing one modality, the gray matter of the brain. And uh, so as you also know, it plays a big part uh, in cognitive deficits, also in multiple sclerosis. So are you going to incorporate this as well? Very good question. Thanks, Betty. Um, yes, if you help me to um, to calculate them. The beauty about this multi-layer uh, theory is that we can add in different aspects of brain regions as long as we know how they're connected. So if you have a gray matter network, I can just plug it in. <laughs> yeah, the math, yeah. the math is the same. Yeah, it's for team size. Yes, yeah. so happy. She's happy. Well, we already collaborate, so yeah. this will happen probably. <laughs> good. That's good news. Yeah. Mathen, Khan, are you there? So maybe you yes, can ask. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we cannot. Maybe yeah, to, uh, there you are. To follow up on the dis this discussion, um, uh, would you think that, for instance, tractography from diffusion MRI would help to generate connections also from gray matter, so not only within white matter? Would this be one? And do you, what role do you see for functional imaging to uh, uh, to study gray matter specifically? That would be my first question. Mm -hmm. Let's do the first one first. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think both diffusion and grey matter networks will be important. I mean, um, as Betty already said, we know that all these different uh, modalities relate to cognition, and that's exactly the reason why we want to bring them together. Um, so that would definitely be very important. Um, as for uh, the functional, yeah, you, we, we can add them all in. And the beauty about the multilayer graph theory is that we can really see where the noise is in the system. Because if you connect everything to everything, that's also not going to help, and that's what we see in patients with epilepsy, for, uh, for instance, if everything is connected, it doesn't work. So what we will really try to hone in on is which connections are most efficient also across these different layers and which ones are most important to keep, um, for, uh, to, to keep cognition working, basically. To keep it working, yes. Okay, yeah. Fleur, Fleur, let, let me see. Where are you? Yeah. Hi. 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 Um. Linda, thank you very much. It's a very important work you're doing, uh, looking at all those different modalities mm -hmm. um, and connecting them. Um, I have a question about the, um, uh, of course, you're looking at very uh, different uh, connections and doing a lot of correlations. And I was wondering, can you tell a bit more about how you define the clinical relevance of the uh, findings? Mm. Yeah, very good question. Mm. Um, so all of the correlations within the multilayer are um, analytically should be analytically solved that's the beauty of using a mathematical framework like network science um, where we already know from different types of networks in which you can actually measure connections instead of what we're doing we're, we're of course looking in from the outside with fMRI or even DTI um, so um, within the multi-layer there's less of a problem with all these correlations um, but then for the clinical relevance what we've done now uh, is to really see statistically whether um, the adding the multi-layer adds to explaining cognitive variance. And this is what we really want to um, improve on in the brain layer project by also predicting. So if you simulate what will happen in a particular patient, you can obviously test 
in empirical way whether that will happen and that will, will give us a, a level of certainty of how clinically relevant these measures are really are because it's longitudinal data so we can really follow up within a patient and see what happens and check with uh, our models with reality. Thank you, Fleur. I'm, I'm trying to read your expression. Yeah, she's happy. <laughs> Fleur from Rotsiller. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks much for Fleur. your questions. Martin, you had a second one? I'll yeah, give yeah, you a yeah. chance, a short opportunity. Yes. Thank you. So do you see any perspective for uh, artificial intelligence, specifically these neural networks they are called like yeah. graph neural networks? It looks so closely related to your research. Yes. It's yeah. exciting yes. if this could be connected to what you're already building up. Certainly. Yes, yeah. it's all numbers. So basically the, the multi-layer and it, it, it's all numbers. So we can definitely feed it into a, a deep neural network or try to work on it with artificial intelligence. I would say it's already part of it, actually. So it's, it's already artificial intelligence. It is already, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. If, if, if you want to know more and you want to more, uh, ask more questions to Linda, she has a breakout session at 12. I Open expect up. that one person. That I, is expect, <laughs> I still expect that one to person to... at least come to, to the breakout room. Yeah, to, to the breakout room. And then afterwards you tell us, right? Yes, and then yes. we will expose her. <laughs> no, I think that the person likes it that, it, that you can use Slido anonymously if you want. So that's feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we still uh, would love to see your questions and comments coming in. Okay, then uh, Miriam van Zuiden. How to predict whether someone will develop post-traumatic stress disorder after experiencing shocking events in life and maybe even prevent it? Because there are big differences there as well. And uh, you will talk about your approach. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So indeed, I will do that. I will uh, tell you a little something about the eight-year consortium project that we recently got funded. So the two ASAP projects, it's funded by Son & Wei. Uh, the mental health program in which we indeed aim to eventually prevent post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so talking about post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, that's a psychiatric disorder and I think its most characteristic feature or symptom is that people who have PTSD, they have frequently reoccurring intrusive distressive thoughts or memories, nightmares or even flashbacks about traumatic events. So traumatic events, they may be car accidents, other accidents, uh, experiencing physical or sexual violence or other types of life threat. And actually people generally think that these events may not be so common and PTSD is also not so common as well. But unfortunately we now know that 80% actually of the Dutch general population will experience an event that qualifies as traumatic throughout their lifetime. So that's about the majority here in the studio and also watching online. What we also know now is that actually 10% of those individuals will meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder at some point in their lives. So one in 12 or 13 Dutch adults uh, will qualify, qualify for a lifetime PTSD diagnosis. Uh, that's not such an optimistic story, but there's also an optimistic part about this. So because PTSD is unique in the sense that it really needs to be preceded by a traumatic event. That also gives us the opportunity actually to apply preventive interventions just in the few weeks after a traumatic event happens uh, to prevent a long-term adverse outcome. outcome. Um, but what we really need for that now is that we now know that these preventive interventions, they are not so effective, but also not so feasible if you want to apply them to everybody who's traumatized. Uh, so we want to apply them really to those individuals who are at highest risk for development of PTSD. And for that, we need actually accurate, reliable detection of this group in the early weeks after trauma. So we have the traffic light. What we actually would like to have is uh, an early screening or triage in which we can say, okay, you're green, you're good to go. You will probably do well, although you may have some initial distress. Uh, and those that really get the red light and we want to give them preventive interventions. So we call that inter indicated preventive interventions. Uh, and that's also what our consortium is, uh, is uh, aiming to do. So what we're going to do in this consortium is first of all, we're going to use existing cohorts. So that's cohorts of emergency department patients, also from our own research group, which we collected before, but also from five international uh, sites. Uh, to first of all investigate the PTSD course and etiological mechanisms associated with PTSD risk. And we're also going to use our own cohort to uh, first derive a prognostic risk screener uh, for PTSD risk. 
So we're taking measures that we take within the first month post-trauma, a broad range of information, and we're using that to forecast PTSD at one year later, so one year after trauma. Uh, so then we're going to establish a new cohort, also of emergency department patients again, but also broader. So we're going to work with Slachtofferhulp Nederland, Victims Aid, it's a large platform. And we can recruit a broader population of people exposed to accidents, crime, uh, violence, other types of calamities. And in this broader cohort, we will again investigate mechanisms, but now we will investigate a lot of new promising mechanisms on which we haven't collected data before. So for example, that have to do with sleep, circadian rhythm, fluctuations in sex steroid hormones. Uh, we will see how these relate to PTSD risk. And then in this cohort, we will also validate the risk screener that we developed and also see whether it generalizes to this broader population. Uh, and then as a last step, we actually will put the risk screener or the instrument that we developed to the test. So we will use it actually to select people for a small RCT uh, to really test the efficacy of such an indicated preventive intervention. And this will be an e-health intervention that was already tested in some populations, but not really as preventive intervention for PTSD. So you may think, are we the first to think about this early recognition of PTSD? Now, well, yeah, obviously we're not. Uh, only the existing instruments thus far, they're really not accurate enough to really use them at this point for screening early after trauma. So we think that we have come up with a project in which we think because of several reasons, it's really feasible at the end of this eight year to really have this instrument ready for implementation in the pract uh, clinical practice. Uh, so what are we going to do? So first of all, we're going to apply machine learning, uh, also as many others are, and other computational techniques that really allow us actually to weigh all the risk and protective factors that are present within an individual. Uh, that's really new because usually what people have been doing thus far in risk instruments is that they really just sum up the, the amount of risk factors or early symptoms that are there, and then there's a specific cutoff. But we will really weigh this. Um, Furthermore, we know that females are actually at one and a half to two-fold increased risk for PTSD after experiencing traumatic events compared to males, and we are going to be really focusing on this sex difference. So really looking at sex differences in the etiology and the course, and also and going to investigate whether we really can perhaps improve prognosis by really developing sex-specific risk instruments. Um, we're also going to do external validation of the instrument we derived. And it, I think it seems quite obvious, but it's often actually still quite forgotten to really have this external validation before you make the assumption that you can really use the instrument. So we're going to do that. And with the broader population, we can also see whether it generalizes. Um, furthermore, we're going to involve experts by experience. So Formerly traumatized individuals with or without symptoms afterwards are going to be helping us in focus group to really um, improve the information we give to prospective potential eligible uh, people to be screened to really improve the uptake and also the feasibility of the projects we will uh, develop. Um, we really reserve the final part, so the final one and a half year, I think, of the project to really think about and prepare the clinical implementation of our uh, research uh, risk instrument really as a web tool uh, subsequently. So we hope that at the end of this eight year, it's really, it's really ready for clinical implement implementation. And I think what's really important is that we opted to include a screening instrument that's only based on self-report. And we did that uh, because with that we can increase the empowerment and also the engagement and the sense of self-control that recently traumatized individuals will have in their decision making, really to undergo this risk screening and also potentially if we uh, say, okay, we think you should do a subsequent intervention to really undergo that. But for that, then we only have uh, self-report information to really, um, so that they can really give the answers themselves and they're really fully in control. Uh, but as a consequence of that, that, I actually think that our study is more biology informed and it's really biology based. So we're going to translate everything that we know now about the biological correlates of PTSD risk and development and translate that into self-report information, for example, diaries about sleep or diaries about menstrual cycle phase during the traumatic events. And we're going to use that 
in our risk screening instrument. Uh, but actually now I think I'm also giving away sort of my hidden agenda because we're setting up this new cohort uh, of a lot of recently traumatized individuals, hundreds of them, so that will hopefully still allow for adding some sub-studies of in-depth phenotyping, biological phenotyping in the end. Um, so obviously team science again, uh, we cannot do this alone. One research group will not be able to do this alone. We got uh, several partners with whom I'm very happy. They're all experts on the topics and the methods we need. And uh, together, uh, I think we will hopefully make this work. And I would like to acknowledge them very much. Thank you so much. I hope you will make this work too. Thanks. Wiesje van der Vlier, you might have something to say about this. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Presentation, thank you for that. And I was uh, particularly amazed about the prevalence of post traumatic stress disorder, that it really happens very often. And I'm not sure whether you actually told us what will be the preventive intervention, but I was wondering whether it's actually a lot about empowerment, whether it would even be feasible to say, well, let's not wait for the traumatic intervention, but just integrate this in educational programs, for example. Uh, focus. Uh, so, is it about yeah about avoiding the the the, the accidents, the violence, the the stress, mm -hmm. the, the trauma, or is it just about empowering uh, people? Yeah, that's a good question. So, what uh, we could distinguish between actually primary and secondary preventive interventions. So, primary preventive interventions they're all about either preventing uh, the traumatic event actually to occur, um, or uh, really defend prevent symptoms by giving psychoeducation, for example, uh, before the traumatic event. So what we're focusing on is secondary prevention. So we're going to give an intervention after the traumatic event has occurred. And that's mainly because of, for most people, we don't, don't know when exactly they're going to be exposed mm. uh, to traumatic events, for example, in emergency department patients. So what we're going to do is actually giving them a self-help e-health intervention. So again, it's all about the sense of self-control and empowerment. So this is going to be an intervention that we will recommend them to, to follow or to take. Uh, but they can follow it at their own pace, on their own smartphone, on their computer. It's called Support Coach. It's actually translated from an um, intervention in the US that's also developed there. Um, in which there will be psychoeducation, but for example, also techniques and um, ex examples based on, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy. Support coach. Support thank, coach, thank, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Tinka, Tinka Polderman, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have something to say or to a question to ask? Put on your microphone, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Put on my put on my microphone. We but, all do that sometimes. Um, thank you, Miriam, for a very interesting talk and, and congratulations with this eight-year project on such an important topic, trauma. Um, I, I actually have two questions. One is on the more pros pros prospective side of your design, and one is on the outcome measure. Namely, can you can you can you ask them both, and then we will make her answer them at one time? Okay. Perfect. Good. Yes. <laughs> Both. So first of all, how trauma, you define trauma in, in a quite, to my opinion, heterogeneous way. It can be an accident, it can be uh, being raped, it can be some, some other violent act. Mm. Uh, so it's a very heterogeneous outcome. And how important would it be to focus on, let's say, subdomains of trauma? And my other question is about um, the biomarker assessment, as you describe, and at as I also read in, your, in some of your work, is all very shortly after a traumatic event. Would it be interesting to put up a more, let's say, prospective study design? It's quite ambitious, I can imagine, but that you would have an insight in average levels of all these biomarkers, these hormones or oxytocin or cortisol, whatever. And so that you have a more, um, yeah, more of a prospective study design. I can imagine you would use a population sample or something for this, where you follow these people over the years and then wait until a traumatic event happens. Actually, it's in 80% of the people. So maybe yeah. it's not that ambitious. 
Great let's, question. Let's, let's listen yes. to your response. Yes. So this future research perspective, I like it very much. Obviously, that would be the ultimate setup. Um, so, but before we can really do that, because we have to include so many people then still, because yes, there's an 80% prevalence of PTSD, but it's across the lifespan, right? So you may still wait a long yeah. time for people to mm. getting exposed. Uh, so that's why we opt in the meanwhile for either following people that were just recently trauma exposed and then look at this first period to see whether something changes over time. Uh, but also, for example, at risk populations such as the military, where we can already measure just before potential exposure. Mm. Uh, but yes, what you just said, that would be definitely be the ultimate end goal. And the first part of the Yes, question. and the first yeah. part, so yes. Trauma is definitely super heterogeneous yeah. in terms of exposure, uh, but we also know that there are common uh, or shared mechanisms and risk factors, but we are definitely going to incorporate actually the trauma characteristics in the prediction, so to say. Mm. So we can see how they interact with other risk factors and perhaps for accidents, some risk factors may be more relevant than, for example, for interpersonal violence, exactly. Exactly. which we know in Excel itself actually has a higher risk for PTSD. Thank you so much, Tinka, for your question. And there is also a question in slide from Farzane Malekpor, I think. But he says also, do you think that the COVID crisis may also cause some kind of post-traumatic stress disorder in some population? Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. It's life threat. So yes. It's a life threat. Yeah. And it's a threat in, in, in many other ways as well, right? So many other ways. So also definitely other outcomes such as depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. but then PTSD, I think, for people who are directly uh, affected. So getting ill or having their loved ones getting ill, of I think, course. yes, definitely. Yes, it's clear. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, online panel, for the questions. So far, you can still be there and you can just uh, uh, raise your hand if you want to say something. Uh, let's discuss this now in, uh, in, uh, all together. <laughs> and of course, uh, our Muppets on, on the chairs there, well, they, will, yeah. <laughs> the grumpy, grumpy they will join us whenever, whenever they want. But first of all, what is your first response or thought when you hear your colleagues elaborate? Go ahead, really, really feel free. Cool. Really cool. Really cool. Yeah, yes, really there was, cool there was a, a Victoria de Philippe. She said that, you, that she really loved your approach. Uh, Thanks. Very, she thought it was very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Really cool. What was yeah. cool about it? Well, what I think we all sort of do is enriching the, the sort of um, view that we have on disease um, mm. and making it a, a little bit broader in a way. So yeah. it fits really well, I think, also with teams. You think that that's well. what's common in, in yeah. all of your researches, yeah, so. right? What yeah. do you think? I think it also provides a lot of uh, potential for uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, the imaging part connecting with like a uh, more biomarker part would be really interesting, I yeah. think, and then that different one. disease. And uh, I think this also provides a lot of opportunities for that. Yeah. Well, you're a scientist, so you have a critical mind. Exactly. You also have uh, critical questions uh, to ask each other. <laughs> <laughs> or some objections, or maybe you're jealous. Or <laughs> jealous. No, so we, yeah, one thing is that, that popped into my mind uh, when you were talking about uh, the imaging part. So uh, this is also about resolution, but it's a different kind of resolution that I was looking at, mm -hmm. I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do different techniques, how, how good is the resolution in the different techniques, and yeah. how, how can you combine that? Because at, yeah. at one way you can look at the cells, but the other way is more general yeah. uh, area. So very uh, good question. So this is, I think, where team science is most important. So each of the modalities have their own very like benefits, and they mm -hmm. all has, have their downsides as well. So the important thing there, I think, is to know them, to have experts mm -hmm. for each modality to contribute to that, and and for us to realize how these different resolutions all play into each other. So that's basically what we're doing now as we gear up to do the actual longitudinal stuff. Um, and that in general, I think, is, is also when going really to cells, which is not in this particular project, mm -hmm. but we also do, mm -hmm. um, that is the key. And that's what we've also discussed about before. So exactly. there, I think time is, is important also to, to know what the other person is doing and to talk about that and to allow for these questions to pop up. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark, you said uh, yourself when we talked uh, that you said my, my research might be just a bit uh, boring. It's not that complicated. What did you think of the other ones? Were they more complicated? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> no, no, but, 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 but what I meant is... Uh, yeah, what uh, did you mean? Well, I hope that in the rest of my career, sometimes I can also focus a little bit, bit more on disease mechanisms. Mm. Because this is... Um, I mean, it has to be done. Yeah. But... Um, 
I, I do think it's it's not that interesting. Oh wow! <laughs> no, that's that's interesting to say about your own research. Yeah, but I mean, it's not something <laughs> that I mean. Sometimes you have to do a few years of, of uh, grunt work, right? Yeah. To mm -hmm. to to make True. progress. True. Because all as he the, the, the things the impl that we implement, we didn't invent them. No. We just applied them for this you know specific use, and it has to be done. You have to validate. It takes a lot of time. And there will be many applications, but I do hope that, uh, for instance, it's always great to hear all the stuff that's going on yeah. that, uh, during your daily work. You're just focused on your own little thing. Um, Which one do you think is exciting? That, 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 now, well, <laughs> of course, that's going to yeah, be you have very to biased. No, yes, no, yes, please. But, uh, what Gijs is doing, mm -hmm. the, the diseases we, we look into yeah. are kind of sure, yeah. genetic disorders that also have inflammation as, mm -hmm. as part of their pathology. So I was... Very interesting. If interested, if if we can maybe in the future Definitely. see if his work can help us understand these genetic disorders and the brain inflammation yes. they cause. You agree? Definitely. You have to try I that. I want to ask an, an additional question. Yep. Go uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I was uh, hoping that I could still ask a question to uh, Linda. So a bit back to the former topic. Go. Really uh, uh, liked her multimodal approach with uh, imaging. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, the difficulty that I see, and I was just wondering her thoughts about her thoughts about it, is that the more predictors you add, so the more imaging modalities you add, it will always explain more uh, variance in cognition. Mm -hmm. But how do you think that which modality is going to add which uh, information? So on a more conceptual level, what are your thoughts about it, Linda? Because I know you've given that a lot of thought. I hope that you can have, give that a brief answer, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Again, again, Linda. <laughs> very, very brief. Um, I'm so very sorry. It's a very good question. Uh, I think this is where using um, graph theory is really the benefit. So we know from graph theory, from networks, that the, the synergy between layers happens in a non-noisy way. So it happens in a way that we can predict based on these connections, but it's difficult to then go back to the individual layers. It's a complex system, the brain. So basically what it allows us to do is instead of having to combine all these things in the way we usually think about statistical predictors, uh, we can put it into one analytically uh, solvable sort of thing, uh, set of numbers, uh, that hopefully will tell us more and, and that teases out the noise. So in analytical work we know um, that this multilayer is less sensitive to noise than just adding them up in a, a statistical model, which is what we've been doing now, and then of course you overfit your your outcome. So and of course she has a breakout session at twelve, so you yeah. can also join and, yeah. and ask more, and then you find out more. It's okay. difficult to explain Th this. Thank really. you so much, because we have to talk about funding and money a little mm -hmm. also. Because Miriam, you have a, a Veni grant yes. and, and and a major one, Son Son. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, you just showed that. And Gijs, Mark and Linda, you all have been awarded with your VD grant, right? Mm -hmm. So what did you think, you, uh, why did you succeed in gaining that grant? What do you think? Yes. yes. Uh, how? Well, how did you do it? How and why? <laughs> yes, how did you do it? Well, honestly, partly luck, of course. Oh, wow. Well, you, you always say that. Right? No, but it's <laughs> kind of true. I mean, there, 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 there are, of course, many excellent applications and only a few will be awarded, so you need that too. But I think that what, what helped a lot uh, is, is that most people saw the, the relevance of the research, although it was maybe not the most innovative. It, 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 it did have the potential to to have m many practical applications. But very relevant. Yeah. OK, I see. Yeah. What was the secret with you? No, so uh, after the... Um, you, you get back the response from the committee, yeah. and, and uh, their major point was, it, it, because it, this is so new, mm. uh, they want to invest in that, uh, to, you know, to, to study this for MS, but also for other diseases. So it's, it's a completely new angle in the field, and, and I think that's the, the reason why they funded it. Yeah, OK. And Linda, did you, did you think that you were, would be uh, awarded with it? Honestly? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. And you, you too? You all, you all were I, confident? I was not that confident. Not that confident, no. No. Especially not after the interview. <laughs> <laughs> no? It, 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 it didn't go well. And I, I think that nobody walks out there with the feeling, gee, that did go that Is go that true? Well, no? <laughs> well I, I actually liked it. <laughs> <He did. laughs> <laughs> but you liked it yeah. even. So you had, you had, yeah, of course, okay. you, were, you were nervous in the beginning, but when, when it started, it, it was actually really nice. Yeah. yeah. And also, you learned that. So yeah. uh, I went for an ESC starting grant first, didn't get it. Went for the VD the year before, didn't get it. So uh -huh. It's not like I knew beforehand 
this is my shot, I'm gonna get it. No. It's also a process and just keep keep going. Keep trying. going, yeah. yeah. Hold on. Yeah. And try again. Yeah, is that is that the same it for you? It was the same for the Vaney, although yeah. it's a bit more junior league. Mm -hmm. I also got it uh, the second time around. First ah. time I got to the interviews, didn't get it, and then the second time I got it. And with this uh Sol and Way program, it was actually a one time call that was put out there and I thought we had really good chance of getting it because we were really we really tried to incorporate all the elements that they also put into the goal. So we made, we made a great effort to really go a bit about outside our comfort zone and really uh, look into what they wanted us to get from this project. And we really tried to, to, to make it that way. And I think we also really succeeded to have this with the clinical impl implementation part and the experts by experience part. We, I, I knew we had everything in there that they, they wanted to solid. see. So yes. Yeah. Okay, I see. And, and maybe so, one thing yeah. to add, mm -hmm. just practical tip: mm -hmm. practice your interview. Oh, oh yes. good. Mine I practiced also with Diederik, and uh, I'd say <laughs> that that did help a lot. I changed yeah? a lot after. I, I think so I too. A, that yeah. that might help. Yeah, that then you have help. critical I questions. A, I had a coach. And I would really recommend that also. A coach. Like a presentation for coach for the interviews. Yeah. Practice yeah. coach. That is that is a good thing. We have we have one in the institute for that. Do you think that you uh, that your let's say your generation is better at, at um, uh, gaining funds or <laughs> <laughs> selling they themselves? They, they have, have to. to be better. Yes. Why? Why would you say that? Well, because fun becomes more competitive. Yeah. So it's more conditional than in the old days. And there's, there's not more so money I admire available. Them. I admire, you admire them. I admire this new generation because oh. they get funded. Wow. Do, do, you, do you agree? Is it something that you should be admired for because it's hard? In, in part, I agree with the luck part. So there's a big luck part, and also the the, the opportunities that you get. So when you are in a, in a good situation, a good context, sure. then it's easier to get it. Mm -hmm. And I also agree with Arjan that uh, that the, uh, we are trained to do so from a from a from the start from now. the start. So in that sense, yeah. yeah. Do, do you think you get enough support from the organization? Good question for you. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I think you should also look for support if you if you need it, right? Because I think everything is in house uh, for people to mm -hmm. succeed. Because a lot of people got these kind of grants, so they have a lot of experience. Uh, but that's well regulated if you if you have such a grant going, yeah. um, it's good yeah, for interview and everything. Yeah. Yes. So 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 how do you think that that team science and always uh, the need always the need for more funds and money and and you you have to spend a lot of time. Mm. Uh, trying to find funds, uh, how, how does that uh, help or not help each other? It doesn't help. It doesn't. No. Tell me. No, that, that I think we all agree eh, that if you have to spend so much time mm. on getting funding, you start to make safe choices. Yes. You start to do things that you think, well, it's maybe not my best idea, but it's relatively safe. So you're less inclined to get the money. Mm -hmm. look for risky collaborations and original ideas. Ah, do you, do you agree? Yeah. Uh, I, I like to do risky things, uh, and, I, and I look for people, uh, uh, you know, t the expertise that I need to to, to solve a cer certain hypothesis. So, um, but I, I get the point. It, it takes a lot of time. Writing takes a lot of time, and, and once you get some grants, it's it, it seems to be easier because you know yeah. you have this now going. Mm -hmm. But to get to this point, it's really tough. Yeah. I, I would like to hear you, Arjen, and Dirk, about well, think, this you issue. Know, could, could we have a thesis that team science would make you? as a generation more competitive because actually you get the grants because you cross borders in disciplines. Yes. Yeah. I think that is a, a good element. Mm. If you stay on your own lane, you know, you're less likely to get the grant than if you do team science across disciplines. Is, there is, a is, that a, is that a reasonable thesis? I think so, yeah. but it takes time to develop the team, yeah. right? And yeah. to find these collaborations and opportunities. So you you yeah. as an applicant have to go outside your comfort zone. So that is the first step that you have yeah. to take. And, and by joining forces in a team, you become more competitive. And is there a solution for the, for the, the amount of time? Is there a solution? To, to, is there a way that it will take less time? Well, I so think you, you should your use the job. older generations. Yeah, and, uh, use yeah. the older generations. Yeah, I think because they, they are best practice models. Yeah, And okay. also use it efficiently. I really like writing grants because mm -hmm. it helps you to, to tweak your thoughts and to I see. think of new things. So I, I try not to think of it as I have to do it to get money, but it's a way to really sharpen what I want to do. Oh, that's nice. Um, you already start there. Yeah. That's what you say. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you so much. Well, you have work in progress, so that's that's lovely. And what we're going to do now is thank you for, for this morning, and we will uh, proceed later. And what we will be doing now is you will leave the room, the four of you will leave the room, and you go to your breakout room, and they're going to move right now. They put on their mouth masks and are going to walk that way. Thank you so much, online panel, for your wonderful questions. Wow, oh yeah, <laughs> it's dangerous. And, uh, and you, you see a link below under the live stream and there you can uh, make uh, your choice and of course it's 12 o'clock so we feel uh, we feel it's fine if you want to grab a cup of coffee or uh, a sandwich and take it to your breakout sessions and then we will uh, discuss uh, more of these interesting topics and you can ask all the questions you want and they have all the time for you and then we will return at 12 30 here with us and then we will have Hilgo Bruining with his uh, Swammerdam lecture. So thank you and go ahead. I think that they might have arrived by now. <laughs> They're young, <laughs> young and fit, <laughs> and and, uh, and and if not, they will uh, appear in seconds, I suppose. So you can click uh, your link uh, right now and go to your breakout room and breakout session.